Hello and welcome to Press TV's News Analysis. I'm Kavit After nearly one month of Occupy Wall Street protests, the campaign against the global banking industry has arrived in Europe, particularly Britain and Italy. In this edition of the Press TV News Analysis, we will discuss the significance of these Occupy movements, why they have gone global, and why it's not just about the banking industry. Tens of thousands of Italians protested against corporate greed and embattled Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi's economic policies. Protests were staged in major European capitals and other cities, including Athens and Frankfurt. In London, <laughs> police used kettling tactics in an attempt to contain Occupy London protests. A number of arrests were also made. <laughs> Ralliers in countries across Asia, as well as in Australia, also joined global demonstrations supporting the Occupy Wall Street protests in the U.S. Like the people in the Philippines, the American people and the peoples of the other parts of the world are, um, are, are tremendously affected by the crisis of capitalism. And um, all over the world, people are rising up, including women, um, to um, fight for our rights, to fight for the future of our children, and to fight for the future of the those at the top and uh, to say that we want an alternative, one that's based on human need and human rights, not on, you know, corporate greed. And he believed the recent popular movements, including the Occupy Wall Street campaign, have been inspired by the revolutions against pro-Western regimes in the Middle East and North Africa. Earlier this year, the leader of Iran's Islamic Revolution predicted that the winds of change blowing in the revolutionary nations will ultimately reach Europe and the U.S. یکسره تسلیم سیاست های فرهنگی و اقتصادی آمریکا و صهیونیست کردن قیام خواهند کرد. It's yet to be seen how the U.S. and its allies will respond to the growing protest movement that swept through the West as people become increasingly frustrated with their government's capitalist policies. Well, let's try to find out why these have spread at the rate and speed that they have. Let me first introduce our guest. We have from London, Chris Bambury joining us. He's a political analyst. From New York, Don DeBar, an anti-war activist, joins us. And from Paris, Max Kaiser, financial journalist and broadcaster, rounds off the list. Gentlemen, welcome. Let me go first to you, Chris Bambury. The Occupy movement against inequality has officially gone global in over 80 countries. This should be ringing alarm bells loudly, yet reactions of respective governments almost none to lukewarm at best. Why is it that they're not reacting at the veracity that these protests are taking place? I think it's because the government in Britain, David Cameron, across Europe, in North America, basically they have a one-size-fits-all answer to this crisis, which is austerity measures aimed at the majority of the population, cutting living standards, cutting welfare provision, cutting jobs, and they are determined not to move from that position. Here in Britain, the Cameron government will not countenance any other policy apart from driving through this austerity movement. And secondly, that agenda is largely shared by the official opposition in these countries. They may argue over the rate of implementing the austerity measures, but they accept the need to make those, uh, make those cutbacks. So if you like the establishment, the politicians, the corporate heads, all the rest share an agenda and are refusing to be budged from that agenda. And in formal political terms, there is no political force in conventional sense that can move that. And that's why we're seeing protests on the streets, because in that situation, people feel deserted by politicians, they feel deserted by parties of the left, and they'll be taking action in their own hands. And I think they're right to do that. And we're seeing coming together some interesting coalitions 
On the London protest today, we saw trade unionists with people in precarious jobs, unemployed students, pensioners, people with families, even tourists joined the protest. In Italy, we see radical trade, union, trade unionists coming together with social movements, with uh, students and so on, in alliances. And I think the commentator from America can speak for herself, but we're seeing exactly the same forces coming, uh, coming together. And this is a very well-informed movement. Government ministers and media pundits try to dismiss it as saying it's basically just anti, 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 it's anti-capitalist, no more. No, this is a movement which has obvious solutions. For instance, Greece is bankrupt. People know this. Right. There is going to be a default, but the default should be in the interest of the people, not of the bankers. We should be cutting expenditure in war in Britain and America and spending it on welfare. There was money for war in Libya. There's not money for anything else in, uh, in this uh, country. We should be taxing the rich and pursuing those people who avoid tax or, or tax fraud. That would cover the British balance of deficit if we just collected in, uh, collected in the taxes. Right. But of course, the British government and the Greek government are sacking tax collectors just at the moment they need that money. So there are real alternatives. It's an informed movement, an intelligent movement, which is drawn inspiration from Egypt and elsewhere. Today in the city of London, people were putting up imitation street signs saying Tahir Square. In other words, they've looked at Egypt, they've drawn lessons from Egypt and Tunisia, I want to apply them in this country. Okay. Don DeVar, same question to you. I mean, uh, what is it going to take? We are seeing what the respective governments are exercising in terms of austerity cuts as being the solution. Of course, at the same time, we're seeing that this idea of bailouts is still continuing. The G20 uh, meeting of finance ministers wrapped up in Paris, and of course, it was about recapitalizing banks, saving Greece, and uh, uh, the bloc's rescue fund uh, to be given uh, ramping up the firepower there. But I mean, what is it going to take? More people to come and occupy the streets of these respective countries? I mean, don't officials see how big a movement this is when it has gone global at the scale that it has? Yeah, I, I think it's significant, first of all, that the uh, Frankfurt uh, event happened because that, that was held outside of the European Central Bank which is the center of where the decisions about bailing out Greece, European banks, etc., uh, those are being made there. And there was a very large demonstration, which was not expected, held there. In terms of the global picture, um, this is the fifth week in New York where this first started today. It starts the fifth week. And now uh, it's in 900 and something cities today in 82 countries. Then that's just what people are aware of at the website where they've used as a clearinghouse, basically. Um, people are in really bad straits across the world. It's not news to about half the population because they've been in bad straits since the advent of colonialism. But the, what used to be the middle class in the so-called first world countries uh, has been in crisis now, um, walking into a crisis for the last 30 years that was hidden by easy credit, um, but they metabolized their wealth in the forms of their homes and their savings, which dwindled, their equity of their homes evaporated, um, and now they're saddled with debt and very poor uh, prospects of employment. And so for a change, you're seeing a commonality of interest being recognized across the bulk of humanity, and you're seeing that the cause of it is the crisis of capitalism, which has been required by its own dynamics, and this was described by Marx 150 years ago, to intensify the exploitation of labor and to intensify and broaden the return on capital. You reach a point where that becomes a crisis where you've extracted all of the value that's possible without replenishing the ability among the working people and consumers to keep the machine going, to keep the hamster on the wheel. And now that they've used the last tool in their toolbox, which was credit, um, and they can't blow air into the system anymore. People are aware of the fact that it's an end game situation. There was a class war. The 1% won. Now what? And what they're doing is organizing themselves because the political structures have been so corrupted for so long and so non-responsive to the needs of people that these mm -hmm. Occupy uh, events are basically general assemblies where people are constituting themselves as a government. And as you see that develop further, as they raise demands and the demands are not met, 
you're going to see people actually act as governments globally in concert with each other through these general assemblies. We're going to get to that point in a second because they're saying there's a leaderless movement. But Max Kaiser, give us first your impression. And I remember listening to a couple of things that I think, uh, well, maybe you could expand more on it. And you said people should take capitalism in their own hands as a tangible uh, way. And also you said in terms of targeting stocks of certain companies, I believe, in one of the uh, coverages that I was watching you on. But you tell us first your impression. And what about this uh, notion of capitalism not working? Well, I think uh, what's really captured people's imagination is the scale of the fraud. Uh, so, for example, just recently, Wachovia Bank, which is now owned by Wells Fargo, uh, whose biggest investor is Warren Buffett, was caught laundering $400 billion in Mexican drug money, cartel money. They don't dispute it. Nobody disputes it. They paid a small civil fine. Bank of New York was just discovered by uh, Harry Markopoulos, the man who exposed the, Mer the uh, Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme. They've stolen over $300 billion from pension accounts by stealing three-tenths of 1% of every transaction they've been involved with going back 30 years. Uh, then you've got, um, I'm just looking at the, the Supreme Court today in America, has, has sided with the corrupt mortgage uh, banks through what's called the Mears scandal, where they had robo-signing of mortgages and they had um, fraudulent mortgage inducement, they had uh, forged documents. So now the Supreme Court is okayed and give their blessing to no prosecution for a uh, $600 billion scheme. So just in the past week, uh, we've seen over a trillion dollars stolen from the American people through outright, unequivocal uh, fraud perpetrated by bankers like Jamie Dimon. It's no surprise that his house is being surrounded up there on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. It's like the Supreme Court and the Obama administration is taunting the people. It's almost as if it's uh, Marie Antoinette who's saying basically, come, come and get me if you think you're so tough. You know, and historically, that hasn't worked well for the aristocracy and the monopolists. And I remember in this country, in France, where we are now, uh, going back a couple of hundred years, there was the, uh, the famous invention of the guillotine that took care of these people. And I, I'm all for it. I think that's what we need to purge the system because we need to get rid of the people who are perpetrating these crimes so they can't reproduce, they can't continue perpetrating their crimes. Um, it, 1793 is the, should be the example. And um, they've left us no choice. So right. uh, they brought it on. So let's, let's, let's bring to them what they want. I think they feel very guilty, and they want us to help them resolve the issue for themselves and relieve them of their guilt and everything from the neck up. Okay, but from the neck up is what uh, Chris Banbury, uh, this movement, many of them are, if not all of them, and also, if not all, uh, unanimously, they all are claiming they're leaderless movements. How will they be able to make changes if there's not a leader in place? How can, that, uh, how can the power be taken out of the ones who have the power and return it back to the people? Because I think they're talking about collective power and real democracy. And I think we've seen that. We saw it in the student movement in this country at the end of last year. We've seen it on the streets a number of times. I think we've seen uh, Max Kaiser was talking about uh, the vengeance of, uh, of the people. I think we saw that in August in this country with the biggest social unrest in decades and people taking it into their own hands. This is what's going to happen. You cannot have such extremes of wealth and poverty side by side. In London, you can walk five minutes from a house which is worth six and a half million pounds towards an area where there is dense overcrowding, real problems of poverty. You can't have that cheek with Joe, there's going to be an explosion. And in this country, we've already seen the biggest uh, student, right, student movement in three decades. We've seen the biggest social unrest in three decades, the biggest trade union demonstration in three decades. We're going to see the biggest strike in three decades next, uh, ne uh, next month. This is in one year of David Cameron's government. These people are actually bringing, uh, bringing it on. And I thought today in Italy, 
the slogan which is being uh, chanted, One Solution Revolution, does actually sum it up. People want a fundamental change, and they will create new forms of democracy. In any revolutionary movement, any upheaval, people have thrown up new forms of, uh, uh, forms of, uh, of, uh, of, de of democracy. In Hungary in 1956, Bruce in examples. Barcelona in 1936, in Russia in 1917, in Iran in 1979 and 1905, well, okay, people give us, created give us some examples, uh, uh, if you have me. We Chris don't need a Tony Blair, a, a Barack Obama, or heaven's sake, a Silvio Berlusconi for us to run things, let alone right. the Royal House of, uh, House of Windsor. These people are an obstacle to progress in history, and I think they will be pushed aside, and that's what we're beginning to see. And people have seen that Mubarak and Ben Ali went in Egypt and Tunisia, they've drawn inspiration from that, and people are looking to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, towards that. At the same time, and I'll stress the point, they look towards the formal opposition parties in Europe and elsewhere, and they don't see anything they recognize, mm. they don't draw any inspiration, and they're rejecting those parties. And that's why they're creating their own assemblies, their own forms of protest. And good job, I think. Good job. Right. That's what's needed in this society. Well, uh, you, you probably didn't hear me, but Don DeBar, I'll ask you this. You know, this thing about democracy keeps coming up, yes. a new form of democracy. What was the democracy? Was it a dictated democracy based on the uh, configuration that the 1% saw that was dictated to the 99% to use the uh, different uh, uh, variations there of the percentages? And what is the new democracy that people are saying? Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, Chris Bambury mentioned it, and of course a host of uh, uh, protesters have said that also. Well, the model that's been used at the highest level of development of democracy in the Western countries is what's called representative democracy. And actually the United States is a republic, which is a step further removed from control by the people. Uh, the form that's being used now um, in these general assemblies, which has been used in some other places during revolutionary periods, is a general assembly or a popular assembly, which is a direct democracy model. You do not elect representatives, but you rather gather together and make policy. You're allowed to bring something to the group, whatever you, demand you want, whatever recommendation you want, and then a consensus is reached on whether or not that goes onto the list of demands or the list of tasks to be pursued. And it's interesting because um, aside from you know being the subject of, say, for example, new left texts of the 1960s, where this was a very popular idea, probably the most widely known uh, treatise on this type of uh, government is Gaddafi's Green Book. And so in a way, you can look at what's happening in the United States as Gaddafi's revenge, as these general assemblies start moving towards a demand and a practice of de direct democracy, where the people make the decisions themselves and see to their implementation, rather than electing a class of people um, through a corrupt election process. I mean, let's face it, the people generally don't choose the two uh, candidates, Democratic or Republican anyway. There's a very convoluted process that's heavily dominated by capital and has a whole legal construct around it that guarantees to, uh, people from you know being shut out of the decision-making process. So you end up with a decision between uh, two choices of capital uh, to run the country, to be members of Congress, even to be mayor or city council members in your own community. And this type of model where the people will assemble from time to time and legislate and um, enact into practice the things that they legislate, it's a new form. It's been tried in a number of places. Again, uh, we just heard Chris mention 1905, for example, with the workers' councils. The Petrograd Soviet, for example, was the first model of this in Russia that ended up being, you know, in 1917, uh, the prevalent model throughout the country. You know, there were things that happened after that, but that happened in Russia back, you know, it's almost 100 years ago. Um, the question I have is, is it 1905 in the United States or 1917? And uh, again, mm -hmm. I point out that some people are saying that what's happening here is actually Gaddafi's revenge. Max Kaiser, uh, a lot of the countries that witnessed these protests, uh, one of the reasons I would think, and you could probably enlighten us more, is because people lost money. Uh, they had investments, for example, in Lehman Brothers when it collapsed, or in the United States, I remember, with Enron. And of course, there's countless of other uh, ways that people lost their money. But in a sense, these financial institutions, where they have branches all over the world, uh, seem to be uh, at least the target, for example, Goldman Sachs in Italy, where it was uh, a, a target. And 
again, Goldman Sachs was also targeted in, in New York City. If, uh, if what would you do, uh, given that you are a uh, financial journalist and you're in tune with these financial institutions, in order to reverse this and have tangible results come down to the people for there to be a reversal and to satisfy them? Well, uh, I was a stockbroker on Wall Street for many years, and before I got my license, I had to know inside and out the Securities Act of 33 and 34, which was put into place after the crash of 1929 and during the Depression that resulted as a result of that crash. And that document, as along with the FDIC and Glass-Steagall, uh, which was put in place by FDR, created the American century. It created the boom that we call the American success story. Uh, for the last 20 to 30 years, principally since Reagan going forward, that's all been destroyed. Now you have a kleptocracy. There's no rule of law on Wall Street. It's very easy to steal money. I mean, I was working on, on Wall Street. I was for Payne Weber was the name of the firm. And I worked also at Oppenheimer. And we stole money every day. And we, were, we, we paid off the compliance manager who worked in the office every day. We bribed the options trader on the desk every single day. But we were only stealing millions. When you hear the stories today about stealing hundreds of billions uh, every day, uh, high-frequency trading by Goldman Sachs, they steal $100 million every single day. It's totally been documented. They don't deny it. Lloyd Blankfein says, yes, we do steal this money, but we're doing God's work. He's a market fundamentalist. He believes in killing himself and others to make money. You know, we need is the, our Islamic and uh, Arab brothers to help us with this. You know, what about declaring some fatwas on these guys? Forget about Salman Rushdie. What about Jamie Dimon or Lloyd Blankfein? Give us some support. We're desperate over here. These guys are killing us. They're market fundamentalists and terrorists, and we're dying. Maybe you can help us. Let's get rid of them. Chris Banbury, I am sure that uh, obviously the officials that are in power, like David Cameron or like uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, they're aware of what's going on. But yet, of course, in the UK, 83 billion pounds in austerity cuts is announced. And we see what's happened in Greece and other countries, such as Italy and Spain, with their massive austerity cuts, while what Max said is going on. Why is that, that they're allowing this to happen? Because, as I say, they're committed to a neoliberal agenda, a free market agenda, from which they will not budge. And their only answer to this is to make us pay. And when I say us, I mean the vast majority, 99% of the population. It's our jobs, our pensions, our wages. They're going to pay for, uh, pay, uh, pay for this. And they refuse to budge from this uh, tenant. But I think you've also got to say something else. There's a financial crisis. There's a debt crisis in, uh, in Europe. But also the economy, there is zero growth. You look at why Italy was downgraded, it's not particularly got a financial crisis. It was downgraded partly because Silvio Berlusconi's ineptitude in terms of, uh, the, 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 as is seen, but also because the Italian economy is not growing and labor costs in Italy cannot compete with those in Germany. There is no real economic growth in Europe or North America. And that is pulling down the rest of the world. Because already we've seen the one economy which is growing in Europe going into uh, uh, reverse, which is Germany. And that's going to affect uh, uh, China as well. China sells to Europe and to North America. A collapse in the economy is going, uh, in, uh, in Europe and North America is going to affect the rest of the world. And we do need help because what we're seeing in Greece is exactly what happened in Argentina at the beginning of the decade before last. And it was seen in, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere in the 1990s is the IMF and the European Commission, the European Central Bank coming in, implementing uh, a structural adjustment program, which devastates people's lives, uh, lives, uh, lives. And you're seeing Greece being rolled back decades, almost a century in terms of social services, living standards and life expectation. That is a fate which awaits other countries in Europe. Portugal, Spain have been thrust into this already. Spain, uh, Italy is now in the mire. Belgium is in the mire this week after having bail, after having had to bail out one of its biggest, uh, biggest banks. And Britain, to be honest, is teetering on the edge. Ireland is already, uh, already there. The crisis in Europe is a real crisis which is spreading. But it, what the effect is, is of a devastation in terms of people's uh, expectations. And that's why okay. young people, and this is very much a youth right. revolt, are on the streets. Because they can see in. Unfortunately, what fate awaits. Chris Bambury, I apologize. We're out of time. Thank you, Chris Bambury. From London, political analyst Don DeBar, thank you so much. He's an anti war activist. Max Kaiser, financial journalist and broadcaster, thank you all for your views. And of course, you, the viewer, send us your views. 
questions or comments in addition to a newsroom at PressTV.ir. From Mikhail Vitakhoi and the entire team in Tehran, it's goodbye.